Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Hospitality TV. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, I'm currently sitting at Costera Restaurant uh, with somebody who I have the pleasure of calling uh, a good friend now at this point uh, and has been a tremendous influence to the beverage community as a whole here in San Diego. Uh, the current beverage director for Cohen Restaurant Group, instructor um, at SDSU for the business of wine, certified sommelier, certified Cicerone, the certified specialist of tequila. He runs his own wine blog, mauricescrew.com. Make sure to check it out. Um, and a couple of phenomenal tasting group, groups here in the city dating back to 2009. So really, really, uh, I'm sure most of you local San Diegans know him, but for those of you that do not, Maurice, how did you get here? Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Actually, uh, before I start, I wanted to say thank you to you because you are super awesome in everything you do for San Diego. <laughs> I you, mean, man. doing this kind of stuff is just so cool. And uh, it takes people like you like, to kind of have that know-how and kind of push forward and do it to get things going on to the next level. Thank so, you, man. Thank so, you. You've been so an inspiration cool. for sure. So thank you so much. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, Chad, please give us a little insight into like how you got into the industry, this crazy, beautiful yeah. uh, industry of beverage and wine and restaurants. I fell into it like everybody else. You know, you're going to college, you got to work as a server. And I traveled around the world a lot when I was in college. So it gave me a job where you can work for, you know, um, nine months, travel for three months, take some time off, go travel again, work again. And during that time when I was working and traveling is I realized that there was like wine. And then as I traveled to places, they had wine. And so they had food and all these different things. I started kind of putting together. So I come back to my restaurant. So like, oh, this is cool. I started learning something new. And then I was, got excited about it. And uh, most of the, I think my, I got my feet wet really in San Francisco, where I started opening restaurants there and being able to start working directly with wine. And uh, that's kind of it all started. And then it took off from there. I moved to San Diego in 2004 with, uh, when I got near, newly married, my wife who living here. Did you meet her in San Francisco or here? I was living in San Francisco, but okay. she was living here. Got it. And uh, so she brought me back to San Diego. My family was already here, so it was easy for, to come back to San Diego. And um, and then just one thing led to another. I've been with the com the current company since you know 13 years now. So yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So which restaurants were you at in San Francisco? I think you were at the Foreign Cinema for a little bit, like a couple other Foreign Cinema. We opened uh, Alma was back in the day. Um, Shea Spencer, is, yeah, I mean, all these so are, cool. are gone. They're no longer there, but they're they're staples. And at one point in time, For sure, was, yeah. that dot com boom that was going on, it mm -hmm. was it was money then. It was it was pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was working at uh, Aqua around two thousand five right. and six. Kind of, I guess, still during that boom. It was good times. Yeah. Crazy, crazy biz power business lunches. Yeah. Every just burgundy yeah. everywhere. Yeah, it, was it was good awesome. times. Awesome. Um, cool. So you got here. You came back here, and then you joined as a. Uh, the wine director or sommelier for Island Prime, Island just Prime. as the one restaurant, the one restaurant, yeah, right? I came back to San Diego, like, what is going on here? That was like, I moved 10 years back in time, it seemed like. <laughs> they gave me a wine list, I was like, okay, here you go, Maurice, this is your wine list, you're going to be working with Southern Wine and Spirits, and it's got to be all California wine. I'm all, what? There's no <laughs> way. And, uh, and he goes, look, what if I can show you that I can sell more than just California wine? Can we, you know, move forward and give me the, you know, give me the right to bring more wine in? And they said, yeah, no problem, let's try it out. And sure enough, I was able to do it. But um, it was about teaching and educating the staff and getting them to know what, what these, you know, what is Bordeaux and what is Burgundy and, and, and having them experience these sorts of things. And yeah. that kind of like kind of made my, uh, gave me a little niche in my company. And people went, oh, this guy's serious what he's doing. So they gave me more respect. Can I ask you about that? What, because I love like specifics and like, you know, just kind of takeaways for people to be able to use in their own scenarios. But what, like what type of education were you doing at that time with the one restaurant? with the one location. All right, so we had a lot of, you know, every restaurant has struggles, right? So you have um, you have those servers that are gung-ho and want to learn everything and they're out there on the floor and selling it and they know the value of it. Then you got the ones that are coming in and doing like, you know, they're in college and they have to work a night job somewhere and they got to make money. They're not that interested, but then they start finding, they start seeing the interest in it and they start going, oh, wait, this is kind of neat. I like grabbing them and, and then showing them how to do it. And then you have the ones that just don't really care and you don't waste your time with those. Right. You just gotta forget about that and, and don't take it to heart, which I took it to heart all the time when they weren't listening or whatever it was, but just like, let them be, you know? Yeah. So um, I just kind of let it go that way, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think what the, the secret is, is that you gotta work at it like 110%. So when you leave your work, you're still working. Mm -hmm. I was working, you know, to, you know, on the floor till about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I'd go home till about two o'clock in the morning, 
you know, write uh, uh, programs or, or teaching seminars, come back, put that in. So on my time off, mornings, nighttime, I was always working. Yeah. And that's what it takes. You know what it's like yeah. to do this kind of stuff. Is you're doing it on your day off, you know? Right. And that's the only way to get it forward. Right, you know? right. So they saw a return on investment in you, <laughs> right? It's working. So how do you put yourself in a position to you know, become, was it, you know, taking on a second, third, fourth restaurant, or at what point did you get, like, to reach the tipping point no, to, so I think, I to think oversee what it is, the whole program? No, I think what it is, is not, it's luck, first of all, but also it's hard work, luck, and then, um, and then trying to show value for yourself, and how do you do that, okay, so, like, you got to find out what's, what's not working, and try to make that work, so, for example, here's what we should do, like, I have to get creative, you got to think outside the box if you, you stay within the box you're never going to get to where you want to go you've got to get outside that box it's, this business is changing all the time you got to move the, go with it right so for example um okay wine and wine is one thing in the restaurant okay it's it's part of what i do but also managing the staff is another part of it and we saw challenges where we had like you know the bus boys being mistreated by the, the servers. The servers uh, not showing respect to the bus boys. Bus boys don't want to work for them now. The food runners don't get the respect from the servers or from the heart of the house, and the heart of the house is not is mad at the servers. And it's always kind of like in house fighting. Mm -hmm. And we're all a, we're all after going for the same goal, right? We want to have the best service, the best uh, guest experience, right? And how do we get that to happen? So how to get creative and how do I do this? Because yeah, I can use wine, but wine is like it's not everybody's interested. In. Not everybody drinks wine. It's not a it's like part of your sales. I mean, seventy percent of sales are food right right so how to do is uh, cut creative and I, I did more like things for camaraderie sake so I got like thing called the gastro challenge gastro challenge is where I got like uh, two servers a busboy a food runner and a line cook on the same team they I gave them a bottle of wine gave them 20 bucks to go to the store they had to go get uh, ingredients for the store they came back to the restaurant on the day that we were closed in the afternoon and they would have 30 minutes to put together their pairing with that wine that I gave to them and they worked together as a team. And then they had like five, six different teams within the restaurant. So now servers and busboys who never really talked to each other are now mm, hanging out and doing something together. Yeah. And so we did something with that. Or how do I incentivize the, 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 the busers? You know, they, they can't do sales. They can't sell like wine at the table. So what I did is incentivize them with a thing called the Table Olympics. So Table Olympics is all the busboys get together pre, pre shift, and we have like the four top table vault or the uh, the, the relay uh, t eight top turn. And they had to like <laughs> they had like reset tables, timed them. They had to do like perfect perfect uh, markings and everything's got the same spot. They got judged and points taken off. And then I had my, my vendors drop off cases of wine for them. And they yeah. whoever won won. But it was things like that that kind of outside the outside the box that I, I think I started showing to my company. Like this is the kind of stuff we can do in our restaurants to make to bring it to the next level yeah. and the next uh, uh, how do we incentivize to have a good strong working force because yeah. that's what the key to it all is. A hundred percent and that's I mean that's really I mean I'm sure you face the same thing just as you're saying like kind of building that culture within a company and making sure that people are working together is so if we don't have that none, nothing else matters right like then you're just going to get burnt out like trying to teach people wine if they're not even happy there to begin with in the first place. Yeah. So the, that's actually a really cool idea like putting them into, um, into teams to kind of attack a a goal. We actually, um, one of our chefs started doing that in the kitchen too. So they were putting together teams of uh, groups of between front of the house and back of the house to do uh, yeah. cooking competitions in house. It worked really well. Yeah. I mean, you get these guys who normally wouldn't even, you know, they're not talking to some of the chefs in the kitchen too much, and now they're hanging out at pre shift. You know, yeah, it's you, gotta, you get out of your daily routine, and you got to break it up because it's, it's monotonous. It's, this job is monotonous. You know? One hundred percent. So, what type of things do you look for? You have an amazing song on your staff, Ashley Phillips. I want to give her a shout out. I love her. She's, cool. She's so passionate about cool. what she does. Like. Um, but what do you look for in a sommelier at this point? Well, I don't really hire very many sommeliers in our group. Um, we're looking at managers, and that's like where, where it is most of the places, yeah. you know? Um, my restaurants are so different. You know, I have like gastro beer pubs. I have uh, cook your own steak places. I got like, you know, fine dining. I got um, uh, a, a coin house, which is like video games and beer. I mean, so it's like everything's so spread out. Uh -huh. So um, I don't have restaurants I'm looking for sommeliers because that's only a handful of me, five restaurants I'm going to have yeah. someone on staff. Yeah. And that's someone has got so to be able to do it all. For, how about for a, a legit manager who can, who can perform in these restaurants think, for you? I think somebody who um, has passion for what they're doing can teach those, those around them and also uh, someone who's going to you know, be willing to, to listen to what I have to say because a lot of times someone just want to do their own thing. Right. And yeah, you can, you can go and buy the most 
amazing, unique wines out there, but if you're not selling them, you're not making the company money, it doesn't do any good. Right. They're sitting there in the inventory. So they have to know their numbers, they gotta know how to move inventory and, and, uh, and understand what works with their restaurant, what doesn't work for their restaurant. Yeah. Um, so I wanna backtrack a little bit, um, if we can, because I think that, um, you know, I, I mentioned in the introduction, but you've had two, um, probably the most longest running tasting groups here in the city. Um, and I used to, there was a time where I used to come to them quite frequently and um, just a, a great amount of talent of um, a lot of advanced sommeliers here in the city going for their masters. And uh, overall, I th I, one of the most f fun things out of that group was just kind of the networking. Like it was a really great place to meet other people who work yeah. in our city and kind of hear their stories and see where they're going. And can you tell us about those tasting groups? Yeah, I think it started like 2009. It was like myself, Dustin Jones, Tammy Wong sitting around and blind tasting each other on bottles of wine. And this is before we even really knew what we were doing. We were just having fun ourselves and stuff. And then, and then we had this guy named Richard Matusak who came in and uh, uh, Charlie Plummer kind of set this up with us. And um, so Richard comes into this group and he starts kind of organizing. We use my restaurant set because it's, you know, there's parking there. It's open middle in the, in the morning. So right. we have glassware, we have everything you need. So it's a perfect place to do it at. And then uh, little by little, it was like, you know, vendors would meet other uh, sommeliers and they're looking for a group. They would recommend our group. And it was always about open, open arms to let everybody in. And then also at the very beginning is to say, look, guys, we're in this to learn. I don't care if we screw up every single tasting. No one goes out of this room and talks bad about it, uh, somebody in this group. Right. Because that's not it's about. It's not right. competition. It's about for us to learn from each other. Because I'm trusting you, because no one is like a master taster from the beginning. You no, know? it's 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 humiliating. It's hard work, and so we got to make sure we keep it within the group. And that's what kind of happened. We have like two groups now: North County and then San Diego. And I have about maybe uh, 30, 40 people in North County, 60 to 70 in San Diego. Kind of rotate. So every every Monday, there's always going to be a handful of people there to taste. And stuff. Right, so right. It's it changes all the time. We used to have you know guys going for masters. Now we have guys going for intro. You know, so it's right. like all over the place. It's kind yeah. of interesting. You know? Maurice, as a whole, where do you think the restaurant business is heading? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, if you look at the restaurant business as a whole, from uh, you know fast casual to fine dining and everything together. Um, it's a $799 billion industry in the United States. $799 billion, that's two times more than the Hollywood business. So uh, it's, it's massive, it's huge, but there's all different sectors, uh, sectors in there. You have employees, there's probably like uh, one out of 10 people in, that are working in, in America work in the restaurant business at some point. One out of every two people have worked at, in the restaurant business at some point in their lives. So it's something that everybody passes through. So everybody's kind of familiar with it. And, and, and our guests are changing. We have a different clientele coming through. The uh, baby boomers are moving on out. They're the ones spending the money on the wines. Now we got this new generation, millennials and Gen Zs that are coming into this new, like, uh, um, uh, uh, new clients for us. And now we got to connect with them. And these guys are not like, they don't, they're not loyal to any brand. They're ready to go for anything. They'll try everything and they'll keep going, but they're not loyal anywhere. So we got to get their loyalty. So it goes back to like what you guys are doing with Hospitality TV is that's the key to restaurants, I think. Um, it used to be that if you were able to open a restaurant and you had a good product, good wine selection, good beer selection, craft cocktails, you were golden. That was it. That's all you needed to do. You right. have that. And you, and those are the restaurants that used to open up in San Francisco and like the service was snotty. They didn't care about you and they were still, they still killed it because they didn't have to care about you. Right. That's not the case anymore. In order to open the doors, you already got to have a good cocktail program. You already got to have a good wine list. You already got to have a good product. That's, that's, not a, that's not a game changer anymore. So then the next thing is, well, how do you make more money? Well, maybe you start discounting and get some better deals and who's got the best, the cheapest beer at happy hour. But what you're doing is you're, you're not getting the right clientele for that. You're getting clientele that's not going to spend money. They're not loyal. They don't come back again. Right. So you want the people who are going to be loyal and come back again. So how do you do that? And that's the key here is, it's, you know, I was watching the baseball that we had on TV over here, right? They're watching baseball games, and baseball has always been like this kind of, it used to be this, this thing, everyone went to the stadium, it was a thing you did, right? And then all of a sudden, like, the tennis started falling down, so what do they do? Well, they had to change baseball. They had to make it more experience-based. You go to Petco Park, there's like craft beers, there's a, a garden for the kids to play and they can run around, there's sandboxes. There's all these different things becomes more experiential-based for, for, for baseball games. And that's what the baseball industry has done. Now us as the restaurant people, we got to do the same thing. We got to create those experiences for those people who are now looking to come out and have an experience. And those experiences are going to be based by our staff. And our staff has got to create those experiences. 
Now the key is how do we get our staff to create experiences for the guests that come, that gives us returning volume of guests is that we have to make them make money. So if our staff is happy, our team is happy, then we all can come together and, and make money. And making money is at the end of the day what we're in the business for. Yep. But it's not, uh, the making money is not the end goal of the game. The end goal of the game is to win, right? We want to win. The only way we're going to win is if we invest in our teams, make sure that they're happy where they're at, give them experience-based um, uh, experiences. When there's a restaurant I go to with my family all the time, I don't like it. It's not my favorite restaurant. I, they don't have a very good co cocktail program. They don't have a good wine list. They don't have a good beer. But I go there all the time because my kids like going there. Right. And every time <laughs> I walk in the door, the service already knows my name. all knows who we are. Knows my daughter's going to have for dinner. It's all taken care of. Yeah. What, why do I go there much more the place I really like next door? Because it's more experience based. It's and like you feel it, good. You feel make you feel good. Yeah. You're part of that. You yeah. Know? So that's kind of I think the secret the, the secret to success is creating that. It's the next we're we're in a whole different um, economy now and it's moving in different directions. So I think we really got to focus on experience based things. Yeah. Um, how do you, you know how do you make your program different from anybody else's? It's you got to get you, you got to personalize it for your guests. Right. Every person in your restaurant is coming in to have an experience. They're either Having a, um, a, a, a celebration of like an anniversary, a birthday, they might be going there and breaking up, they might be going there and uh, uh, taking, out, taking out with their rich uncles for the first time. You know, you never know, all, everyone has an experience they're going to be focused on. If we can make those experiences even much better and bring it to the next level, then they come back to your restaurants again. Right. Yeah. So you guys, how are you preparing for it? Because one of the things that we struggle with here in the city is, you know, the constant raising and the minimum wage and things like that. And, I mean, I'm sure that's obviously such a big group of something that can affect you guys pretty big. That's all we talk about. Yeah, I know. That's all we talk about. What do you guys, are you at liberty to say or share what, what type no, of things I, you guys might implement I think, uh, I think, you know, it managing, when it goes there? Uh, on the on floor, managers that know when to cut their, their, their staff, uh, you, know, you know, looking at the times of business that you really need people on the floor, I mean, that's important. Uh, we, do, we did do a, a service charge on our, on our, on our, uh, on our menus. So You've that implemented kind of that out. already? Yeah, we've implemented that yeah. uh, over last year. Got um, it. About 18 months ago. Yeah. And uh, I mean that's the only thing you can do. You can't raise prices anymore. You yeah. can't. You can't. Uh, um, you can't cut more labor. It's like you, you need the people on the floor. Right. Um, if we're trying to talk about experience-based services, you know, we have to make sure we got people there doing it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So it's we've got to get creative on how on how you do that. You know. Yeah. You know, managing breaks and all that. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. Yeah. Um, I wanted to acknowledge two questions that uh, a couple of people threw out on Facebook. Uh, so one was from Tammy Wong. Superstar, rock star, sommelier here in San Diego. Uh, the former wine director at Jennifer and Ivy, and she's kind of moved on to the sales side now, but nevertheless a big figure here in SD for our industry. Uh, she wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about your work with the local San Diego wineries. Yeah, I've been working with them for maybe four or five years, something like that. Um, you know, being a local native San Diego, I always wanted to promote my region. And um, I think that's kind of when the tasting group came up to be, is because I promoted that. Um, this local kind of like, feel here and uh, and the, when I started looking at the history of California I teach over at San Diego State University history mm -hmm. of California wine classes and to realize how much history actually started in San Diego and why it left and why it was no longer here and where it's coming now it really got me interested right. so I wanted to see what's happening and um, and I started doing more research I started going on tasting one of these wines I said you know they're they're they're, they're gonna be there one day they're gonna be there one day first of all like, we have granite soils uh, we have high elevation we have uh, uh, ocean influence, there's diurnal shifts, and um, there's a uh, uh, potential now that with this water shortage, a lot of other crop crops aren't doing so well, they're more expensive to grow, that grapes will do really well here. So we have vineyard spaces available, and that's gonna be uh, key to it. Now all we need is real winemakers to come here and start really putting their, their footprint into this valley yeah. and see what's going on here. Uh, so a second question from another guy, Brennan Price. What's up, Brennan? Um, just give you a little bit of context about this guy. I think you may have met him before too, but he used to be a, a manager at a Cochina Noteca here in North County in Del Mar, and he's now moved back home to, um, to Denver, Colorado. He's running, or he's working back on the family business. They have a chain of amazing uh, breakfast eateries called Urban Egg Eatery. If you're out in Colorado, go there. It's in the area of Denver, go check them out. Uh, but Brennan, I just wanted to give you a little context. I think you might be able to provide a lot of value and insight to him, but he's asking, because his company's growing a lot right now as well. Um, so he's asking, how have you grown in your role as your company continues to add stores? Yeah, uh, Brennan's awesome. Um, well, uh, what happened for me to have my role was that I had to you know, not focus only on wine. 
I mean, um, if you look at percentage of sales, you know, most of my restaurants have a very low wine percentage of sales, whereas like spirits and uh, beer is a little higher. So I had to really change my focus and really focus on spirits and, and beer, which for me was kind of exciting. It was like learning all over again. And that's what I really loved doing. So, you know, kind of taking that, that next leap is <laughs> jumping into a whole other uh, category was, 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 was important. And I think when you start managing multiple restaurants, you have to do that because restaurants can't afford a sommelier, especially if you're doing breakfast places like that. It's spirits where you're gonna be at. And right. so it's being able to jump into that, understand how the supplier and vendor uh, distribution uh, uh, relationships work. That's definitely key. Um, so actually that's the second, he had a, essentially a two part question. The second part of his question was how has, you know, your role in the company changed with having much more buying power with so many stores? Yeah, you start looking for the brands that make sense. Mm -hmm. First of all, what I first did is I started looking at the brands that were already selling. Mm -hmm. Why try and reinvent the wheel? Right. For, see what the brands are selling, set up partnerships with those brands and see and go the next step. After you start doing that, you start seeing other things and other suppliers come and we start discussing new programs and the programs are constantly changing. So I have to make sure it's evolving and changing right um, but if you're doing like a one concept kind of uh, brand I think it's a lot easier when you do multiple multiple concepts it's more difficult because uh, in some places those brands aren't interchangeable uh, they might work in a higher-end restaurant but not in a lower-end restaurant you know but uh, just playing with that and seeing where you, where you can come up with that is uh, doing a lot of research and investigation what other yeah. groups are doing as well you know yeah let me ask you because you've obviously worked with a lot of managers um, throughout your career and what do you think where do you think people slip up the most? Do you think people get stressed out over the jobs? Like, where do you think like people can do better at in this industry, especially moving in the direction that we're trying to do? I know you're talking about the experiences that we're creating and everything, but like, where would you encourage managers to step up in, in this, in this I business? Think, I think is people get bored. When I was on the floor uh, running Island Prime, I got bored. I mean, I would. Every day you walk in, you make your schedule for your servers, you you look at reservations, change tables, you you know take back refires, you, you know, recommend wine at a table, you order your wine. It was that you went on, you got bored, and um, and I can't speak for everybody else, but this is how my personal experience was that when I got bored, I got home and I started writing, and I started writing my ideas, and I wrote down my blog, and my blog was kind of like a funny blog. It was like just make fun of wine in general. I thought people take it too seriously. So I used to make you know, kind of a, a jokes on my blog and it was kind of fun with that. And that kind of like, like released this whole like creative side I wasn't using on a regular basis. And so I didn't get bored. So I had another outlet for that. And I think that's what happens is you guys, people get bored and what they're doing and they, they don't find it's, it's like daunting. You're like, what do I do after this? Right. What do I do? I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a wine director of this place. My next step is going to be GM. I don't want to be a GM of a restaurant. It's too much, too much work. Or what do I want to do next? Oh, do I go on the sales side and then my whole life changes? It's a different thing. So it's like this kind of battle going back and forth. I think you try to find what you really, really like with your job and focus on that yeah. and do that. And that's what I did. I, yeah. I focus on education. I focus on events. I focus on all, all the fun things in my job. Um, that's what I try to focus on. And that, I think, opened the doors to where I'm at now to right. have this position I can do now. 100%. So, yeah. Well, Maurice, I want to thank you for your time, man. You're such a busy guy. Uh, you have such a busy schedule. You have a family. You're running so many restaurants. You have a ton of projects. You're an instructor at the university. You have countless things going on. I really, really, on behalf of um, I just want to be, thank you on behalf of the SD Beverage community for what you're doing for everybody here. Um, it means a lot. And, uh, you know, it's an inspiration, like I said, to a lot of us here. I mean, we, got a, we have a couple interesting projects in the work our, uh, works ourselves, which we won't get into yet, but a lot of really in interesting things on the horizon. So I'm super pumped on. Um, and I'm just really, really looking forward to what we're trying to do is going to motivate some other people to do more creative things. And it's just going to build and build and build. And it's such a, it's, it's, I'm having a blast, man. It's a really fun time. Um, even though we're working our faces off, it feels, it feels right. So, uh, so thank you, man. I really yeah. appreciate it. Um, thank you. I want to do something that, you, or start doing something on these interviews, which is giving you an opportunity to ask a question. We'll call it the question of the day. Um, to any of our viewers who hopefully um, are people re related to the restaurant business, you know, any, whether it be ownership or restaurateurs or aspiring restaurateurs or you know, beverage or food professionals, anybody, what would you ask uh, somebody watching this show? Hopefully we can get some feedback on it. I'll put it on Facebook and Instagram uh, so maybe you know, we can get a couple different uh, areas to get some feedback on it. Yeah, you know, um, throughout the many years of this business, I always had a dream of having my own restaurant, right? 
But uh, of course, that's no longer, I don't really want to touch you with a 10 foot pole. However, I always want to know, like, what, what would you do as a restaurateur? What would be your concept? What would be something that is completely different, something that hasn't been done before or, or has, hasn't been done enough? And uh, what would that be? What kind of, what kind of concept would you do? What, what, where, where would you take it and, uh, and, and what would that restaurant concept be? Yeah. I love it. I love it. Cool. Hopefully we get some good feedback on that. And uh, right on. Awesome. And I appreciate well, your time. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Guys, lastly, uh, thank you for watching another episode of Hospitality TV. I appreciate your time. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and on Instagram at Hospitality TV. And recently we have our podcast is up live on iTunes. Look for Hospitality TV podcast. Go over there, leave me a comment, review it, rate it, give me some feedback directly to me, anything, I'll take it all. Uh, but again, I really appreciate your time, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.